So we've been in this series now for quite a time. We, we took four weeks off to talk about the resurrection of Jesus, which was pretty amazing. But we've been walking through the book of Acts. And so if you would take your Bibles, turn in, turn on your copy of God's Word to the book of Acts in the New Testament. And, uh, and we're talking about living sent. This idea, this concept is not like a religious concept. It really is a biblical concept. But here's the problem with any kind of communication or belief system related to religion. It gets really confusing in a culture, doesn't matter what culture it is, that's constantly trying to infiltrate our faith and belief system. And you may say, well, what do you mean by that? Well, I mean, it's really clear in, in our culture that there are, mm, like, I guess you'd say um, compelling and even um, uh, adversarial ideologies that are contrary to, if not contradictory completely to, the gospel. And if we're not careful, even as we're living sent, we, like the early Christians 2,000 years ago, are tempted to allow the cultural ideologies to infiltrate our faith system, to kind of permeate and, and dilute the truth. And as we always talk about this balance of truth and grace, if you're new here, you'll hear that a lot, because that, I believe that's kind of the secret to living sent and living like Jesus, John, 4, John 1, 14, it described Jesus saying he was full of grace and truth. I think being full of grace and truth is what separates uh, the biblical church that is sent in our day and other churches that I believe are just floundering around on one extreme or another. If you, if you pursue grace without truth, you're wrong. And if you pursue truth without grace, you're going to communicate that truth in, in a very ineffective way. And so with all of that, here's the thing. We all hear all kind of stuff. I'll say it's trash, but sometimes trash comes from good people who mean well. Um, my mama is, uh, has watched. I don't know if she's watching this, uh, this particular service, but I know she watched this morning. So I'm going to later on have to call her and say, Mom, I didn't mean you. I meant other mamas. But let me give you an example. Mama, you know, usually if mama tells you something, you just absolutely believe it's true. But, you know, there are a lot of examples of things mom said that weren't true. Let me give you some examples real quickly. Do you know that if you swallow a piece of gum, it, it doesn't take seven years to digest? I know some of you are like, are you kidding me? No, it really doesn't. It's a proven fact. Uh, also, carrots do not necessarily pr improve your vision. Uh, frogs don't really give you warts. I, I, I didn't know that. I really didn't until I, if Google said this, this has to be true, right? Um, uh, did you know cracking your knuckles, and, and my daughter, Emmy, has actually told me this before, cracking knuckles does not cause uh, you to have arthritis. I, I've been told that by my mom my entire life. And then also going out with wet hair does not make you sick. Did you know that? I thought for sure that was true. Coffee does not stunt your growth. If you're short, it's something else, all right? It's not coffee. Um, and then this is great. If you cross your eyes, they'll get, see, your mama said it too, man. It's just not true. So if you cross your eyes, that don't necessarily, I mean, have you ever seen somebody with cross eyes? But what happened? I just didn't listen to mom, man, you know. It's just went in and crossed them. And, you know, I was one of those guys who like flipped my eyelids. Did y'all ever do that? You gross people out, but then be like, oh, they're going to get stuck that way. You never see people walking around with eyelids stuck that way, all right? Just doesn't happen. But then the final thing I think is hilarious. Watermelons will grow in your stomach if you swallow the seeds. <laughs> How many of y'all's mama told you that? Raise your hand. See? Bunch of mamas that wasn't telling the truth. Anyway, so these are harmless fallacies. All right, that's what I would say they are. They're not like, I mean, they're in some ways, some of them may be like a wives' tales or whatever, but, but there's, there's also a lot of things that there's funny and don't necessarily, you know, like the watermelon thing. They're harmless fallacies, but there are also dangerous false ideologies in our day. And I would say these are prevalent. And, I, and look, some of you are going to leave licking your chops going, I'm so glad he finally said something like that. And, and then look, the reason we, I don't, I don't avoid tough things, but I do want to make sure when we talk about very difficult cultural situations that we're very clear that they're relevant to what we're talking about in the Bible. Because I don't want to say anything that's politically charged. I don't have any desire to hurt anybody's feelings or make people mad. When the gospel's offensive or when the truth hurts, which it hurts me sometimes, when the truth hurts, we need to embrace it. We don't need to run from it. And so I, the reason I'm not afraid to say what I'm going to say today is because it's, it's true. It's true. But I don't want you to hear what I'm going to say and, and in some way try to listen to the lies of the culture and think that when I'm saying this, I'm hateful. This is not hateful stuff. This is truth. 
This is truth. And I would be hateful not to tell you the truth. All right? And so with all of that in mind, I'm going to give you two. I could give you 20. These are not the major points, by the way. These are just foundational, two dangerous, false ideologies that permeate our culture. And when I give you these, they're going to lay the foundation for application points from Acts chapter 9. So the first um, dangerous, false ideology in our culture is this. What you feel about yourself determines what is real. Our culture is trying to convince you that is true. That what you feel about yourself will determine what is real. Look, if you're a teenager, if you're a child, I mean, I, I want you to hear this, but not just young adults, middle-aged adults, we, we can all kind of be the frog in the kettle and easily allow the culture to confuse us and, and this trash can permeate, it can infiltrate our belief system to where we start actually believing this lie. But what you feel does not determine what is real. What you feel, look at your neighbor and tell them, what you feel does not determine what is real. Would you say that? What you feel does not determine what is real. That's not a trick thing, all right? Is it, let me give you an example. If I f wake up and feel lost, it doesn't mean I've lost my salvation. I may feel one way and it not be a reality. I may wake up and feel like I don't have any friends. Does that mean I don't necessarily have any friends? No, because what I feel does not determine what is real. The enemy, literally, this is the enemy. The devil actually uses our emotions and our feelings against us. And if we're not careful, Christians, as Christians, we can totally give ourselves over to this and think what we feel determines what is real. But even more so in our culture, our culture is telling everybody, if you feel this way, then it must be real. And so what we've translated that into is if I feel, and I'm just going to say a word that's going to immediately cause people to think I'm charging and doing crap about it. But listen, this is just, it's applicable to our culture. If I feel like I am this, I identify as this or that, whatever that may be, I must then, that must determine that this is real. Our feelings, our emotions do not determine that. That doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It get quiet really quickly, didn't it? And, you know, I, I just, it's so, oh my gosh, he's going there. Did, did you hear that? But look, it's, what we feel doesn't make it real. It doesn't. And whoever is telling you that is not your friend. They are lying to you. The culture lies to us. I mean, look, I have felt many times like I should be the cleanup hitter on the Atlanta Braves. You know what I'm saying? But I'm just not that. I mean, I, I, and, and, and so with that, we know. This is true. We know this. What we feel doesn't necessarily turn into what is real. But nowadays, you feel almost compelled, if not forced, to affirm and celebrate insanity in many ways. And we'll see what we mean by this. Because you may say, what's this have to do with Acts 9? You'll see everything. Everything. Look at the second. Well, I'm going to give you a second um, point that's a dangerous false ideology that we must warn our children against. And here it is. You, here's the, the fallacy. You are perfect just the way you are. You are. The culture wants to tell you you're perfect just the way you are. I looked in the mirror today. That is not true of me. Amen. <laughs> I will not be a swimsuit uh, model. Amen. <laughs> it would be like Watching somebody open a can of biscuits. <laughs> you never... <laughs> Sorry to give you that picture. I'm just, would not be cool, all right? And, and, but we live in a culture, listen, we live in a culture that's like, oh man, you know, you're good. <laughs> you may not be good, all right? Don't, oh that, it's like the husband that looks, you know, Oh, I better not get into this, but oh yeah, that, that looks great. And then later on, the wife comes home and is like, you lied to me, you know? But, but I, I think there's so many, you ever seen Emperor's New Clothes? It's this little children's book. If you had not never heard of it, Google it. It's funny. But it's like this emperor, like this, this tailor makes this, this outfit uh, or doesn't and, and t puts it on the king and, and everybody says, oh, it's great. Well, the thing is he didn't, he's naked. But everybody convinces him that he looks great. It's the emperor's new clothes. And being told what he wants to hear, he just walks out and makes a fool of himself. This is our culture. We have, we have illogical 
people pitching insanity in the name of reason. That, that's the day you live in. Now, here's the temptation. One, you have two temptations. One temptation is to rush to it and fight people who are acting illogical. That's not what Jesus would do. You know? Jesus wouldn't insult people and make them angry and make them run from the cross. That's not what Jesus did. It's not what he would do. But he would also not join the chorus of lying to people and, and convincing them they're okay. And so here's the, the truth. The truth is you're not perfect. The truth is you're not perfect just the way you are. We know this to be true. No one has ever said, you know that Vladimir Putin, he's a humble humanitarian, right? No? <laughs> it's just nobody says. Why? Because we know, we know the truth. None of us would ask a serial killer to babysit our children. Oh, but he really is a good guy. No, you're not going to do that. Why? Because you know that everyone is not perfect just the way they are. That's not true. No one on the planet ever said, you know, Adolf Hitler, he was just a, really, he was just a misunderstood victim. <laughs> we know that's absurd. That is unreasonable. That is irrational. And so don't, don't run away from truth. Don't think that you have to give yourselves over to a culture that is selling a pack of lies and that you have to buy them. That is just, that's not true. But at the same time, we're not going to push those people away. So how do we balance this? It's really tough. But here's the thing today. If you came here today and maybe you believed that you were perfect just the way you are, or you thought how you feel does determine what is real. The reason this is so important, and this is why it's clear, I, I don't just mention those things to try to rile people up or to make people laugh or, or, to, or to get people angry, because that's generally why people say anything in our culture today. But here's what I want you to hear. If you don't understand that those two things are wrong, you can't follow Jesus. You can't. Like there's no, I could tell all day long, I could say, oh, you need to embrace Jesus. You need to embrace his grace. You need to ask forgiveness. You need to do, I could say all of that. And you could kind of add it to your plethora of belief systems the way a lot of people do. I had a real good friend. He was a very good friend of mine who was a Hindu years ago, years ago. And, and I loved, I loved him. His name was Kathan. And I, I mean, he was, he, he was a Dunkin' Donuts guy and he would give me coffee every morning. He's very special to my heart. I really did think a lot of him. But, but he and I talked about faith an awful lot. He, he actually got to a point, he'd come to church. He would come to church and hear me preach. And he would say, oh, I love your Jesus. I'm going to add Jesus to all my other beliefs. That, that's not an option. See, that's, but that's how our culture wants to do. They want to just add Jesus. But here's the thing. You can't really follow Jesus unless you recognize that you're not perfect just the way you are. And you can't follow Jesus unless you realize that what you feel does not determine what is real. There is absolute truth. It's not subjective. It's not my ability to go, you know what, this is my truth. You got your truth, I got my truth. No, there is truth. And so with that, our culture has conditioned us to prefer to believe an inaccurate account of ourselves. We would rather be told a lie then be confronted by the reality of our brokenness. But this is the truth of all of us in this room. You're not the only one. We are all broken. We're all broken. This pastor's broken. Without Jesus, I'm hopeless. And there is no religion that can save you. You may be here and you think, oh, the church is what can save me. And I've been part of the church, whatever denomination or background that is. Your church can't save you. And your church is not a stairway to heaven. Jesus is your only hope. And so with that, we see clearly when we turn to Acts chapter 9, everything we're going to look at in Acts chapter 9 is dependent on you believing those two things are lies. All right, so look at, with me at Acts chapter 9, beginning verse 1. But Paul, set, uh, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and he asked him for letters to the synagogue of Damascus. So that he found any belonging to the way, that is followers of Jesus, men and women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. He was going to drag them in the streets all the way to Jerusalem. Now he went on his way and he approached Damascus and suddenly a light 
uh, from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Now, I think it's amazing how one verse can kind of jump out at us. Sometimes people take a verse out of context and they don't think about what's around it. We'll talk about that in just a moment. But this one verse really does, this one passage really does communicate to us something that we don't need to run away from. A couple things. First of all, we can see that, that a Christ follower must never take persecution personally. <laughs> because look, Jesus didn't say uh, at the very end of verse 4, Saul, Saul, why did you kill Stephen? Saul, Saul, why did you persecute Peter? No, he said, why are you persecuting me? And see, we take everything personally. Did I mention the culture influences us? We're so self-centered that even in our faith, <laughs> when people persecute you or, or, or I guess uh, are mean to you because you're a Christian, we get all personal about it. And we're just like, we take it personally. Don't take persecution personally. Because they're not hating you, they're hating Jesus. They're not hurting you, they're hurting Jesus. He is their target. And, and I, I heard someone say this years ago, and it's been really applicable in so many ways in my life. I think when you're being attacked by people, it's a good sign. When you're being attacked by people who don't love Jesus, it's a good sign that you're close to Jesus. Because you're not the target, he is. And so when you're not being attacked, when people are just like, oh, you're the best and celebrating you and nothing's wrong and everything's perfect, it may be that you're nowhere near Jesus, right? Because the fact of the matter is the world, at least a portion of the world who does not want him or does not want to even seek after him, they will hate you because you are part of his body. So ultimately, a Christ follower must never take persecution personally. When we take persecution personally, we make suffering about us, not Jesus. But then also there's another little tidbit here. It's important to notice that religion was Saul's motivation for hatred of Christians. So your answer is not religion. Your answer today is not to be more religious and go to church all the time. Your, your answer today is to follow Jesus, to become a Christ follower. Now, obviously, if you're a Christ follower, you're going to want to be with the body of Christ. You're going to want to grow in faith. But religion's not your answer. If you, if you think religion's your answer, you are hopeless. You are hopeless. So you've got to turn to Christ. Let's keep reading. Look at verse 5. And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I'm Jesus whom you're persecuting. But rise and enter the city... And you will be told what you're to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless. They heard the voice, but they saw no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were open, he couldn't see anything. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight, neither ate nor drank. So while we may not see a blinding light shine from heaven, while we may have not heard an audible voice uh, saying, Wayne, Wayne, why are you persecuting me? It may have been totally different for you than it was for Saul, but in some strange way, we can all relate with this story because we understand. We, as in like those who have become a follower of Jesus, if you've been saved, you get this because you were headed one way. Maybe you weren't a Christian killer. Maybe you weren't dragging people through the streets. Maybe you weren't holding the cloak of the man who was throwing a rock at Stephen when he died, but you would admit you were headed a way that was not Christ and was not Christ honoring, and you met him on your own Damascus road. And Jesus stopped you in your tracks, and he required you to change to follow him. So, so ultimately, we make this decision to follow Jesus, and I should say it like this, he brings radical change to your life. And so with all of that in mind, here are the things we need to believe when we leave. No matter what you came in here with, no matter what ideology, no matter what you had to shake off your boots, all right, uh, that, that just kind of false thought outside because of the culture, here are three things we need to believe when we leave. First of all, God can save anyone. God can save anyone. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter where you're from, what you've experienced. It doesn't matter how far away from God you are. God can save you. And look, I, I think that, that may be a misconception, a misunderstanding a lot of people have about the church today is they think like you've got to clean yourself up and come to church and like be a good person before God would save you. If that was the case, nobody in this room would be a Christian. Not, not a real Christian because there's no possible way we could clean ourselves up enough. It's kind of like you can't clean a fish before you catch it. Right? You have to actually catch it and then you clean it. That's how God does us. Look, we don't come to Christ 
and, and work our way to getting good enough to where he can save us. That's absurd. We have to recognize our brokenness. We are sinful and we need Jesus. And so God can save anyone. No one is outside the range of God's light of grace and forgiveness. So some people get very confused and try to merge Christian faith with cultural ideology and they would amend that and they would amend God can save anyone to say it like this, God will save everyone. Let me say clearly, God will not save everyone. God will not save everyone. His word tells us clearly, he's not gonna save everyone. He will save anyone who calls on his name. He'll save anyone who repents of their sins, turns to him instead of turning to themselves. But he will not force you to follow. And so with that, we, we want to twist it. The culture wants to twist God can save anyone to God will save everyone, but it's not going to help. And you could lie. You could actually join the chorus of cultural trash and tell everyone, you're okay. Hey, love yourself the way you are. You do you, you know? You're perfect just the way you are. You could join that chorus if you want to. Here's all I'm telling you. You need to understand you are aiding and abetting the pathway to them spending eternity separated from a loving God in a place called hell. That is the truth. That is the truth. And you can, look, here's, here's the truth. We can run for, I know that's, uh, go ahead. Praise the Lord. Yeah, I appreciate that. I know like, I know there's a portion of people who are like, I'm really worried Wayne's going to get fired today. I'm not really sure. This is, it's looking tough. Um, but I, I want you to understand, look, it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, we are so conscious. And I'm aware. I, y'all, y'all heard me preach long enough, almost eight years now. We should be conscious not to harm people and hurt people in the name of God. That is absolutely unacceptable. But when the time comes... For us to speak the truth, we cannot compromise the truth because of feelings. We have to speak the truth in grace. We have to speak the truth in love. And so God can save anyone. Now here's where I was talking about context. John 3.16. It's a passage everybody knows. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life or eternal life. And so you would know that verse and even verse 17. It's so consistent with that. For God did not send a son into the world to condemn the world but in order that the world might be saved through him. So if you just read verses 16 and 17, you're like, I love that, Right? Because God sent a son to save the world. He doesn't want to condemn the world. Great news, right? But, but that I think most Christians and, and the world for sure lives like that's all God said. Like he didn't keep, keep speaking in verses 18 and beyond. But look, there it says, whoever believes in him is not condemned. Good news. But whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only son of God. So, quick, simple realization, if you believe the Bible, then here's what you believe, not everyone is going to heaven. Simple, all right? We're not perfect just the way we are. If we were all perfect the way we are, then God would never have said that there are some people who are condemned already because of their sin. So, that, that's a simple realization based on the word. Look at verse 19. And this is the judgment like this is, this is what determines who truly believes. If believing is how you get in, so how do we know if someone truly believes? This is the judgment. This is the determining factor. The light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light, does not come, uh, does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. And so we see, we understand Works don't save you, but they are a deter- a, 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 like a evidence, all right? Our works are evidence if we're truly believers or we're not truly believers. And so, so people, some people avoid the light because they don't want their works exposed. They don't want their sin evaluated. They just, I'm perfect just the way I am. Let me stay where I'm at. I'm good. You do you, I'll do me. I believe in God. And God saves me. God loves me for who I am. Does God love you? Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm a sinner just like you. No matter who you are, all right? I'm a sinner just like you. I'm no better than you. I don't care. It doesn't matter. I'm truly saying this in all honesty. 
No matter what you have done, I can say with complete uh, conviction, I am no better than you, period. But I didn't come to Christ and say, I'm good the way I am. I didn't come to Christ and say, hey, God, you know, you do you, I'm going to do me, I'm going to keep this stuff, I feel this, and so I'm going to, this must be real, this is my truth, so I'm going to live the way I want to live, I'm going to believe in you, I'm going to believe in you, and I'm going to believe the stuff that, that is compatible with my beliefs and what I perceive to be real based on what I feel. <laughs> That's so confusing. But, but... I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna believe all those hateful Christians who actually believe that you think some things are sin. Says it's, it's crazy. So when we come to Christ, we actually have to give up on all that, and we have to say, "I'm surrendering, God. I'm surrendering what I feel. I'm even surrendering what I might have believed prior to coming to you, and I'm allowing you to actually tell me what is real." I'm allowing you to tell me what is true. I'm allowing you to tell me, no matter what I feel, I want you to tell me which way to walk. And and here's the the beauty of that. Um, The beauty of that is following Jesus actually shines a light on our hearts and our lives. The the, the dark places, the areas that we don't want anybody to know about. There is, there is, I've, firmly believe that there's no one who's sincerely seeking God and asking, Lord, would you show me what is sin in my life who doesn't hear God speak? Now, now that doesn't mean they're going to change. It doesn't mean they're going to repent. It doesn't mean they're going to turn from it. But I know in my life, when I've sincerely asked God to show me what's wrong in my heart and my life, and I've looked in his word and I've found what the word of God says about sin, he, he reveals that to us. The only time we get fuzzy is when we try to start redefining the word. When we try to start leaning into what we feel is real rather than what God's word says is true. And so you can say it like this. A man who wants to live for Jesus will have no problem with Jesus telling him how to live. I'm going to say it again. That's super simple, but listen, that's, that's powerful. A man who wants to live for Jesus will have no problem with Jesus telling him how to live. So don't, don't, Don't fool yourself into thinking you want to follow Jesus if you throw all these conditions at him and say, I'm going to follow you as long as you let me do this. I'm going to follow you as long as this is okay. I'm going to follow you with all my life except these three things. See, that's not following Jesus at all. Partial obedience is complete disobedience. So God can save anyone, but this really leads us to the second point. They're almost synonymous God can change anyone. Why did you have to say all that about you're not perfect just the way you are, you know? And what you feel is not real. It's not necessarily real. The reason we had to lay the foundation is because, look, if you, if you think you're perfect just the way you are, you don't need change. <laughs> I mean, it's impossible for someone who doesn't think they need change to be saved. So if you're here today and you're like, man, I... I I'm, I'm here and I'm wanna, I want to believe in God and all that, but I'm, I'm good. I, I, don't, I don't need the Bible to tell me how to live. I don't need God to change me. I just really want to believe in God and be cool with it. And I'm just telling you, that's not what it means to follow Jesus. That's not what it means to be a Christian. And, and that will be a religious person who dies and goes to hell. There are millions and billions of people throughout history who would fit that same category. Let me say this so you don't think I'm being offensive to just general people. Look, look, there's some Baptists who are going to bust hell wide open. They're super religious. Man, they've sat on the pew. I mean, there's like an imprint of the rear end on the pew. They come so often, you know. They've saved their seat. They've got a cushion <laughs> where their seat is. You know, if somebody sits in their seat, <clears throat> you're in my seat, you know. They come. I mean, they've got, they've got all of the, the awards for Sunday school attendance, and they, they are just here. That will, God's not going to be at the gate when you get to heaven and be like, hey, you know, let me see your attendance record. That's not what God's going to do. Did you surrender your life to him? I mean, did you follow him? Or were you playing games? Were you playing religious games? And so with that, change is essential. It's not like a good idea. 
2 Corinthians 5, 17 is like my life verse. And it's because there was so much change in my life. I was like, not just the least likely person to succeed in high school. I was the least likely person to follow Jesus. If you went to Rockmart High School and asked people who went to school with me, then none of them would thought, Wayne's going to be a pastor. Wayne's going to live for Jesus. No, man. God used Amy in, in a lot of ways in my heart and life, but the Holy Spirit of God radically turned me upside down. I am not the man I was. I've been changed, all right? I know that sounds like that ought to be a song. Let's just sing, you know? But that, that, that's, the, that's the story of every Christian is that you were blind and now you see. You know, you were dead and now you're alive. If you don't want change, you don't want Jesus, because Jesus brings change. And God can change anybody. Oh, Wayne, you don't know, man. You don't know. I've, I've, I've been trying to overcome this stuff for 10 years. And I've just finally just given up. I, it's just part of who I am. I just, this is who I am. Every one of us came to Christ identified as a foreigner, a, a, an outcast, abandoned. Scripture refers to us before Christ as an orphan. <laughs> Look, I get it. I, even identifying ourselves and, oh man, I'm just, this is just who I am. I, look, I was one way before Jesus met me on my Damascus road, but he did not leave me the way he found me, guys. And he didn't leave you the way he found you. We believe in a God who can save anyone, who can change anyone, and then finally, who can use anyone. He can use anybody. Man, if he can use me, he can use anybody. Listen to verse 18. And immediately something like scales fell off of Saul's eyes and he regained his sight. And then he rose and he was baptized and taking food, he was strengthened. For some days he was with the disciples at Damascus and immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue saying, he is the son of God. And all who heard him were amazed. What were they saying? Isn't this the guy who was killing people? <laughs> Isn't this the guy who was dragging people through the streets? I think we should be cautious, right? And has, uh, has he not come here to do the same thing to us? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. That's such a pivotal story. It's such a pivotal moment in the life of not just the book of Acts, but the early church. And this story tells us God can save you. God can change you. I don't care who you are. You may be sitting on your couch driving down the road doesn't matter how far away you are, how much you've, you've drank the Kool-Aid of whatever cultural ideology that would be bent against the word of God. I'm telling you, there's nobody outside the reach of God. There's nobody too far gone. Stop believing that lie. God can save you. God can change you. And God can use you for his glory. Preacher who died years ago, who was really just like a foundational figure. We we're missing men like this in our day. Adrian Rogers, pastor of Bellevue Baptist Church up in Memphis. He, I'm just going to quote, it's a statement that's just so clear. I want you to listen how powerful. Everybody will be changed when they meet the Lord Jesus. They will be radically, dramatically, eternally, visibly, spiritually, emotionally changed when they meet the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not just talking about the change that comes when we get better. I'm talking about an intrinsic change. We're not talking about a tadpole becoming a frog. We're talking about a frog becoming a prince by the kiss of grace. That's good. I don't care who you are. That's good. Man, we're talking about a miracle, a change that is supernatural and radical. We're not talking about joining a church or trying to do better. We're talking about something intrinsic and supernatural. So here's what I'm here to tell you. Look, God is not saying to you, if you love me and you want to follow me, change yourself. That is not what God is saying. He's not saying, it's on you, man. Figure it out. That's not God. And look, no matter who told you that, trash, it's not true. Here's what he's saying. God is saying, I love you so much that if you will follow me, I will change you. If you'll just come after me, I will do the hard work. I'm a God that loves you and I'm going to get in the ditch with you, man. I'm not leaving you alone. I'm going I'm to climb into the pit 
If you will call out to me and you'll reach up to me, I will get in the mess with you. I will do the work to change you. So stop trying to figure out how can I change, how can I be good enough for God? No, that's not what God says. God says, I love you too much. I love you too much to leave you in your brokenness. So you come to me acknowledging you're broken, though. You got to acknowledge you're not perfect and you need a Savior or he can't save you. He can't change a person who doesn't want to be changed. So no, what you feel does not determine what is real. But listen to this. What you believe and who you follow does determine if you'll be saved, if you'll be changed, if you'll be used. And it does determine where you will spend not only the 70 to 80 year life that you live on the spinning rock, but all of eternity. Everything rests, everything rests on what you do with Jesus. So I pray today, forget the noise outside these walls. Stop scrolling social media for your ideological life information. Trust Jesus. Stop loving you for your imperfections as far as your sin. And start loving Jesus because he's the only one who can change us and make, him more like, make us more like him. That's, that's the gospel. It's not a bunch of perfect people. It's a bunch of people who realized they weren't perfect and they decided to trust Jesus to change them. Lord, we love you. God, I pray for your Holy Spirit to do what I can't do. God, I, last thing I want to do is manipulate anybody to move to action. But Lord, I know this. I remember the, the day when you just stirred my soul and I couldn't stay still. Lord, I wanted you. I was tired of me. I wanted you God, I, I have to believe out, out of the number of people in this room right now, there are people who need you. There are people who need to step out, God. There are people who need to be saved. They know it right now. There's not a doubt in their mind. They know they, know they need you. There's others who, who maybe they believe, but they need to be changed. They need to turn. They need to confess, repent, whatever it is. But then there's others who just don't believe you could ever use them. They think they're just useless. Lord, would you just speak to all of our hearts and just show us that we need to depend on you, surrender everything to you, God, even work right now in our, in our hearts, in our lives, even how we should share the truth with other people. Convict us. I pray we make decisions, commitments to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand?